So um, I'm Sasha Mazo. I'm a co-founder of a company called New World Machines. I'm actually not the scientific person. I'm not technical by background. So the, the doctor in front of my name is actually the first time I've seen that. My dad goes by professor, so that, that's it's sort of a, oh no, it's, it's, it's a, I, I feel like it's a compliment. But um, <clears throat> I've, I've had a chance over the last few years to learn a lot about solar cooling. We've traveled down a certain path, and I'll tell you guys a little bit about it, because I think part of what I want to, what I want to talk to you about is also technology development. Um, so let me ask a couple questions. How many of you, since it's an engineering class, how many of you guys are thinking about doing, I don't want to make any assumptions, so how many of you guys are thinking about doing something related perhaps to um, core scientific development around you know, new, new climate technologies? Basic sort of you know, fundamental uh, R&D and product development, startup. Um, how many of you guys are thinking about doing something related to, uh, to physical technology? meaning like a, a machine versus software. So physical technologies, software, okay. <laughs> um, uh, policy, are any of you thinking about this from the standpoint of policy and sort of from a broader perspective of how do you tackle climate change and, okay, okay. Any, any other kind of burning reasons that, that, that you're here just so I know the audience? It's really about sort of understanding how these technologies can be applied. All right, so <clears throat> hopefully what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about solar cooling. Focused, um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to do the readings, but the, um, there's two fundamental ways of solar cooling. And um, let's see, <clears throat> this, is, this is the one I'm gonna spend more time on. So um, two kinds of solar panels in the simplest form, right? There's photovoltaics and, and solar thermal panels. Solar thermal predates photovoltaics, at least in somewhat mass adoption. Jimmy Carter had them on the White House before they were taken off by Ronald Reagan. Um, <clears throat> this is true. Um, the um, solar thermal panel is a relatively simple device, right? It's basically, uh, it, it doesn't have to convert into electricity, so you're simply heating water. Right, so the, we can get into the differences fundamentally between the two panels, but, but essentially leading class photovoltaic panels, because they have to convert to electricity, they, I, I believe, are optimally producing about 15 to 20% of the energy that's coming from the sun. They're converting 15 to 20% into ele electricity. Um, a solar thermal panel, because it's really just doing the work of taking heat from the sun and, and turning it into some kind of a heat storage, is converting 60% of the energy. Okay. We can also get into how they're made. There's a lot of issues with how photovoltaics are made. And they've gotten cheaper and cheaper. And when you start to look at the materials th that they're, they're comprised of, they're have been a number of concerns about their, the impact, the greenhouse gas impact of how the things are actually manufactured, what goes into them, what goes into the production processes. A solar thermal panel is pretty simple. Um, it, there's a couple different kinds. Um, there's a flat plate, well there's the pool heater, which is really just a sort of a, um, a plastic or rubber membrane. It's very simple. Um, sun's energy goes through the, the, the heated rubber or plastic material to provide a modest amount of heating for pools because you don't need that much heat. Um, the next step up is a flat plate collector. Um, which is sort of what's represented here. Um, and <clears throat> again, without, uh, without having a, a, a deep scientific knowledge of it, um, basically the construction is there, there's a filament and, and it's encased in, in a, um, uh, on a uh, metal surface, uh, a reflective um, surface, and uh, there's, not, there's not a lot of sort of um, exotic materials that are going into the construction of, of the panel. There's evacuated tube panels, which are then um, in a vacuum that adds to the thermodynamic properties of retaining some of the heat. They have some advantages and disadvantages again, uh, versus um, flat plate collectors. One of the disadvantages that people, unclear whether it's a true concern, but they are concerned about is ice storms and you know, the potential for those panels to, uh, for the tubes to, to break under hail or ice storm kind of conditions. Um, and then there are more complicated solar thermal panels, which uh, there's two kinds. There's parabolic trough and, and linear Fresnel. What those are, are uh, they, they can harness the sun's energy under an even higher heat, and they basically um, 
either in a parabolic fashion or, or they redirect it basically onto a, a focal point, much like sort of a, a, an array of solar panels does, and so you can gen generate heat at a higher temperature. So that's very basic kind of, I'm, I'm gonna cover a couple things just to kind of get you guys up to what solar cooling is. So, um, so the idea basically of solar cooling is you take solar thermal panels, so you heat up water. And by heating up water, you put it into a, a chiller called an absorption or adsorption chiller. Um, I'll talk much more about this kind of technology because that's basically what we've redesigned. Um, and then the, the chiller takes in heat. It uses that heat as energy. So rather than using electricity, it's actually using heat energy. Um, it doesn't need heat from the sun. It can take heat from any source. So um, we're talking about other heat sources being um, gas fired. So you can, it, it, the machine takes hot water. So you, you have a storage tank and you need to heat up the water in that tank. So you could actually take waste heat from a process heating application. Let's say you're a chemical factory. You'll have waste heat available that you could then convert uh, through a heat exchanger to hot water to power the machine. So um, absorption chillers are actually used now primarily in industrial applications because there is a prevalence of sort of high grade, um, high temperature waste heat to, to use for, for cooling. Um, so this is the basic system. <clears throat> um, everything except for the solar field would be basically the same if you were using an absorption chiller in other applications. So the only thing that's different about it that makes it solar is just adding solar thermal panels to it. Um, so basically, you know, the idea here is quite simple. At the point in the day when you have sunlight, you typically are generating heat that, that is heating up a building or a ship or, or, a, or a vehicle. And at that point in the day, your, your um, need for cooling is also increasing. So as you're, you know, at 10 a.m., you start to have some, some cooling gains um, uh, to, to the building. And as you're moving throughout the day, you're, you're offset slightly, but basically there's a coincidence with the um, sunlight of available sun to the, the need for cooling. So with that overlap, the idea is that there's sort of this elegant solution that if you had a technology that could actually harness the sun's energy at the point in the day when you most need to cool the environment, you, you basically have a very elegant way to provide cooling. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not gonna get into, this was off of one of the reading sources. There are a number of different technologies that basically as the chiller also that, that you can use. I'm not gonna dive a whole lot into this other than to say that. Yeah. But I'm thinking I may not be the only one who's wondering, can you explain a little more about what an absorption chiller yeah. does? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I will. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's actually what mo more of the talk is gonna be about because what we've basically done is created a new kind of absorption chiller. Okay. So we'll, we'll dive deeper into that and hopefully that'll be interesting for you guys. I just wanted, wanted you to sort of have a, have a backdrop of solar cooling. Um, so anyway, there's a number of different technologies out there. It's a little bit head spinning when you actually start to dive into how they work, but Stepping back from it for, for a second, I'll tell you that, that absorption chillers um, were invented in the 1850s by a Frenchman, I believe his name is Fernand um, Le Carré. He, so they predate vapor compression chillers, which are the machines that you see on buildings ubiquitously. Um, so electric chillers came about at the turn of the 20th century. So these were actually invented 50 years prior to that. So. Um, <clears throat> We'll jump into it a little, a little bit more. But um, so from the standpoint of you know, some, some different thoughts on solar cooling, obviously buildings use, consume a significant amount of the energy in, in uh, the built environment. And 30% um, of their operating expenses are spent on, on utilities. Of that, um, space cooling is 15% of it. Um, space heating is another 16% of it. Um, refrigeration is seven. So you know these are significant. So if you were if you were if you were a building manager, let's say there's a building manager for this building, and they've tried to make this building as efficient as possible. You're at Stanford. You're trying to to basically have it as efficient an environment as to set an example for your students. So you've got more efficient lighting that's been installed, um, and this these are still I think CFL. So there's there's you know, an opportunity to, to upgrade these to LEDs, but you know, the pr prices have dropped considerably, and so you know there's LED technology, and that's all gonna become fairly ubiquitous. The next 
big challenge in the building space is how do you deal with air conditioning heat and heating systems because they consume a, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the energy in the building. And, and as we optimize the lighting systems, they're, they're proportionally consuming more and more of the energy because they're not as optimally um, built as lighting. Okay. So what's happened to air conditioning in the last 30 years? How, how much better has it gotten? So this is what's very exciting for me to talk to you guys because I think there's a mandate here. I think this area needs problems, has a significant number of problems that need to be solved. I think there's real opportunity. In the last 30 years, this is ASHRAE, which is the, the governing body that sets the standards for air conditioning and heating equipment in the, in the United States. These are their standards and what's happened to them in the last 30 years. They, they've had a 30% improvement. So basically, they're, we're, we've improved our air conditioning by 1% every year in the last 30 years. Okay. So if we're in a situation where we, we have deep climate challenges, this is, this is a huge problem. In that span, we've gone from, you know, we've gone to electric cars, we've incredibly downsized the, the size of our computers, we've made huge advances in lighting, but air conditioning is, is, has not made dramatic shifts forward. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit more about what, what our company is doing and, and, and talk about absorption chillers and kind of how we've redesigned this. <clears throat> okay, so Here's what's, what, this is a campus that's probably, you probably have a central cooling plant that cools throughout the campus. However, in a typical office building, um, you would have something like this, uh, you know, a multi, a mid-size or high-rise building would have something like this. So you have a machine that creates the cold and then you pump the cold through the building. So the, the machine is called a chiller. Um, you have an air handler that basically is determining whether to, how to mix the air um, uh, in the building. Um, and it's basically uh, routing the, the air to fan coils throughout the building. You have a cooling tower because any machine generates waste heat. Um, a chiller generates enough waste heat that you actually have to get rid, of, get rid of that heat in order for the machine to operate efficiently. So this is basically a, a byproduct of the machine. This is what a typical absorption chiller looks like. <clears throat> um, so, I guess, you know, some key points is it's obviously a mechanical machine. There's um, pumps and, and um, you know, large vessels that um, basically need, need to separate the different processes. And it actually doesn't look that different from a vapor compression chiller. So these are, you know, old school mechanical machines. The, the, the way that this machine is designed hasn't fundamentally changed in the last 100 years. Um, is the fluid being condensed and evaporated and absorbed, is it always aqueous? Um, well, in an absorption chiller, traditionally it's, it's water and ammonia. Yeah, and okay. Yeah, or it could be a, a lithium bromide and water machine. So, yes. Um, the, you know, there's some other technologies out there, but for, for the, in terms of an absorption chiller, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of sort of different permutations that, that, that we can kind of go down. But I, I think okay. to, to simplify... Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into what our company does, and hopefully this is interesting for you guys. So we took this, this mechanical machine, and turned it into this. So um, all of the dials on the outside of the machine essentially are just for reading the performance of the machine. Effectively, it's a solid state chiller. So we've eliminated the pumps in the machine. We've, we've effectively eliminated the mechanical components. Um, here's some side views of it. And I'll explain to you guys in, in a couple minutes how the machine works, at least as a non-scientific, non-technical person. Um, in fact, let me jump, jump to that, and then I'll come back to its advantages. So what's going on inside this machine? There's um, thin sheets of plastic. They're several millimeters thick. And we're actually cutting the cooling cycle directly onto those sheets. Okay. So we call it a microchannel. Um, it's basically a heat exchanger, but it's a microchannel design. So the cooling cycle is occurring on those thin sheets, and then you seal the sheets on either side with a steel sheet. So basically, you've got you've trapped the the fluid inside these sheets, and then you increase the capacity of the machine by adding more and more sheets to it. So we call it an ice book, like you know sheets added to a book. Um, if we go back to and, and so you can sort of see the this is just a plexiglass in, in front of the on the right. Um, what the sheets, this isn't very old design, but basically what they look like inside the machine. So we've effectively eliminated all, all the moving parts inside of this machine. 
So it's a total redesign of an absorption chiller. There's actually a new cooling cycle as well. Um, but part of the elegance of this, there's a sort of a simplicity to it where we've actually, so the biggest, these machines have issues in terms of their performance and reliability and how much they cost to make. And these are some of the reasons why if you run a given building and, and make de decisions about how to upgrade your equipment, you may choose not, not to purchase one of these machines. So um, we vastly simplified those different things. And also when you, when you simplify a machine down to this, you can imagine when you're trying to manufacture it, this is much, much simpler to make than this. Okay. There's a lot of steel and there's also um, a lot of components that, that not only need to be manufactured, but then also when you're looking at ongoing operation, operation and maintenance costs, O&M, which is a big concern for people who manage buildings, are, are significant. Okay. So, um, so this machine... Um, how this all came about, our leading, lead inventor was in, um, he's Austrian, he's from Vienna. He was in Tanzania and um, working with, he was there with the Austrian government, he was working with milk farmers and was seeing milk spoiling on the way to market and realized there must be some way to avoid this kind of an issue in a, basically in an off-grid environment. They don't have reliable electric grid there, so they don't have a, a, a means of, of basically um, uh, maintaining that milk at, at necessary temperature. So not just milk, but there's a lot of produce, um, spoilage, and these are issues that are, that are prevalent in developing countries and um, also lead to you know, price gouging where the middleman comes to you and says, you can sell it to me now or it's going to spoil. So, they, so, um, so I'm going to talk about some other applications that are not just solar cooling, just to sort of stimulate your, your, your thinking about this. Um, but that was the back story. So then what we did from an R&D standpoint, from, a, from an, uh, the thermodynamic physicist who invented this machine started from the perspective that that big bulky machine, the manufacturers have all tried to take that big machine and keep trying to make it smaller and smaller. And in, in effect, you still have all of those moving mechanical parts. And when you make it smaller and smaller, it's still very expensive. It still has reliability issues and it's not optimized. So he started from what's the smallest possible machine that we can build? And if we can build a small machine, we can actually scale up from there. Okay, so this is sort of the path of invention for the technology. And he actually went back to um, thermodynamic principles that were from the turn of the 20th century that are about 100 years old in order to um, generate some of the ideas that, that led to this invention. Okay, so another interesting thing about this machine. So, Typically when you have a chiller, if it's um, you know, one room, you need a one ton chiller. Um, a house, you might need three tons, four tons. A building, you might need 500 tons. So typically you just build a bigger machine. In our case, this is a bit like servers in a server rack or like fuel cells. Um, we actually connect the machines in series so that you, instead of having one large machine, you basically could have 500 smaller machines. We actually will build them in five ton increments. So for a 500 ton system, you'll have 100 machines that are working basically in series. Why is that interesting or why is that of value? Um, so those machines are then going to be dynamically controlled. So, so we have an, a proprietary way of electronically controlling them um, in series. So most air conditioning systems, um, you have to you size a, a system for a building at Stanford for probably a 95 degree day. The number of times that that occurs in a year is perhaps once or twice. So you have a, you have a chiller on this building that is designed in order to be able to handle that load. So those are design conditions. And you're actually, there, there's standards by, by way you have to design these things. And so typically chillers on buildings are way over designed. And so they spend most of their life operating at part load. So it's not a cold day, but let's say you were you know, in late spring or summer, they, your machine, your chiller would still be operating at maybe 70 or 80% load. So the, the challenge is how do you optimize a chiller for that part load performance? These are very real issues that are dealt with. So when you have, chillers that are connected like this, you can actually dynamically control them. Um, another issue with, start up with um, absorption chillers is they actually start up really slowly. There's something about the, the thermodynamics of the machine that means that they start up slowly. So if, if in this building you need the air conditioning on demand, that's an issue. Um, so we've solved that again by having these ma machines running in, in series because you can keep one or two of them on a sort of a low trickle and turn those on while the other machines are heating up. 
The other thing is if, if you put on the hat of somebody who's potentially buying the machine you're designing and they're concerned about reliability and they're concerned about buying a machine from a brand new company, um, so we're, we're always thinking about that. How do we, how do we deal with the challenge of um, you know, the, the customer and what, what issues they're going to bring forward? Um, so you deal with reliability. If one of these goes down, it's like a server farm. The rest of the servers are still alive and they're able to function. And you can basically pull out this machine and, and um, the overall chiller still keeps working. Um, I'm not going to go into this. This is, this is um, this is a thermodynamic representation of the new cooling cycle within the machine. Um, and since I don't have a thermodynamic background and this isn't a thermodynamic course, I'm not going to dive into it. But there, there is sort of core science that's different about the machine um, that allows it to operate more efficiently. So I'm, I'm going to talk, let's talk about applications. Um, actually, let, let me jump jump here first. Okay, so we talked a little bit about solar thermal and obviously the benefit of this is once you've installed the system you essentially have energy from the sun that's free. Now you don't have to size the system, we're just keep using this building as an example. You don't need to size the, size the system for 100% for load of this building. You may not have enough roof space for that but you could still t take some of the load for the building and use solar for that load. Um, you might have waste heat in this building or there might be waste heat nearby. So you could actually supplement that by also putting waste heat into the system. You can work, use them in tandem. Um, you might, you might um, decide to use gas as a way to heat the machine versus electricity. Why would you want to use gas versus electricity? So um, putting aside coal-powered coal uh, power plants for the moment, gas-powered um, electricity generation stations or power plants, they only deliver about 30% of the energy that they consume to the end user. So when you get electricity at the plug here, it took you know, two and a half times that in terms of consuming gas in order to generate that electricity. Some of it is lost in the production, some of it is lost in the transmission and, uh, uh, of, the of the electricity. So if you can actually use gas directly at the source, and if you can use it with an efficient chiller, it's much more efficient than burning gas in order to generate electricity, which then um, you convert into cold. Okay, so from an from a engineering standpoint, trying to come up with the most elegant solutions, which is if you can take heat energy and, and produce cold without having to um, convert it into electricity, from our point of view, that, that's a much more elegant um, way to solve the problem. So let's talk a little bit about applications. Um, so chillers are, the, are big machine central plants in the top left hand corner that you find on larger buildings, um, on, on industrial applications and mid to large sized um, uh, office buildings. Uh, the, most of the machines in the US, most of the um, cooling and heating is actually done by um, what are called rooftop units, which are um, Basically, if you, look at a, if you look at a shopping mall um, on the roof, you have multiple little units, even big box stores. A Walmart will have eight or ten of these. Um, these are the least efficient. Um, they last, the, they have the, the lowest lifespan, um, the most uh, reliability issues, but they also happen to, happen to be the cheapest. Okay, so it's not really that surprising if you think about that combination as to why those are the ones that get installed because these big box stores might be in business for 10 or 15 years. That might be good enough for them or that's the framework that they're looking at and um, cheap installation price. And to be honest, they weren't that concerned about how much money they were spending on um, electricity on their monthly bills until recently. Our energy costs in the U.S. are really low. Californias are twice a lot of the U.S., but the, U the U.S. generally is you know, half to sometimes even a fifth what people are paying in the rest of the world for energy costs. So these things are ubiquitous. 80% of the commercial buildings in the U.S. have those. Um, and they're horribly inefficient. Um, so there's a lot of work being done to try to solve that issue and, and our chiller can actually work for that. Um, obviously there's also the issue of refrigeration and, and ice making. So this is a, you know, I don't, I don't know what in total um, is the amount of energy that's consumed, but there's a, there's a huge amount of energy both in, in terms of process, so all the industrial energy in transporting, refrigeration and ice making, um, you know, it's not just sort of a, you know, grocery store uh, consumption of, of refrigeration. Um, 
And then CHP and micro CHP, I don't know if you guys are familiar with combined heat and power. So this campus may have a combined heat and power plant because it's large enough. You're shaking your head, so I'm guessing that's the case. I know, for example, working with UC Davis and they have a central plant. So basically the idea is you have a, a location that's big enough that you can have your own, it's like a small power station. It takes gas in and generates electricity. And then it also generates heat. And um, it can potentially generate cooling as well because, again, you've got heat energy. You can use it to power an absorption chiller, and we call that then tri-generation. So um, a combined heat and power plants, typically you call it cogeneration because you're generating electricity and you're also generating heat. And then when you add cooling to it, it's tri-generation. Um, and then recently there are companies, including some in, in Silicon Valley, that are trying to do micro CHP, which are basically like fuel cells that are, again, offering um, heating and uh, uh, electricity from uh, a fuel cell in a smaller application where it doesn't have to be a huge uh, college campus. Um, other kinds of applications, so obviously residential air conditioning. Um, so transportation is an interesting one. Most, uh, I, think, I think both large cargo ships and also cruise ships use these combined heat and power plants, so they have um, readily available heat uh, to, to provide cooling. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of refrigerated transport that, that's going on. Um, and then as I mentioned, to kind of come back to where this began, um, there's an interest, for us there's an interest in off-grid cooling because I think that um, there are a lot of parts of the world where that would be a game changer in terms of both you know, produce, but also, you know, there's, there's critical applications like hospitals and schools where if you're able to provide cooling to them, that's going to make a, a, a meaningful impact in terms of, uh, you know, the quality of life. So that's something that we're actually, as a company, we're, um, we have a nonprofit arm called OneFridge, which is loosely based on sort of one laptop, one child, um, where we're looking at ways to bring cooling applications to third world and developing countries um, off-grid. Uh, through something like this. So basically the idea would be you could take a cooling machine with a solar panel on top of it without any kind of a um, electricity power source and put that in the middle of a remote location and you'd have um, cooling available. So you could do village cold rooms, you could do ice making in those applications. Um, you know, so there's also, you know, whether, uh, depending on where your, where your orientation is, um, uh, for example, you know, the military, in Afghanistan, they're transporting jet fuel in order to power generators in the field. So if you think about this, you know, again, in those kinds of applications, and often um, the military tends to be advanced in terms of bringing new technologies to market. They tend to be real proponents of leading edge um, technologies. So here's, just to kind of make it a little, a little more tangible for you guys, here's, um, this is in our, R&D lab in Australia. Um, here's the kind of cutting the sheets, the plastic sheets and the channels into the sheets. And assembling them, layering, layering them on in the ice book. And this is the machine on a test bench. So we're, <laughs> we're just using um, hoses basically off the shelf. I think they're, they may even be garden hoses to, to run water to the machine. Um, and these are the, this is the efficiency, the performance curves of the machine um, based on its rejection temperature is the um, waste heat. Um, so a critical, a critical component here is your waste heat temperature versus how hot, your ambient temperature, your outdoor um, heat temperatures. Because, the machine operates more efficiently if you can get rid of the waste heat from the machine. So if it's hot outside, it's harder to do that. The uh, cooling tower has to work much more aggressively in order to be able to reject the heat. So there's different per performance based on that. Um, and this is sort of the basic configuration uh, of our machine in a solar cooling system. Um, so the, the ice books the, is in the blue. And um, you have a hot water tank, so the machine just takes hot water. So basically you've got a hot water tank and you use gas as a backup. So even if you had a solar cooling system, someone asked me, uh, one of the questions was, how do you use this for high-rise buildings? So the answer is that you sort of use it in, in tandem with other heat sources. You can use gas or if it's available, waste heat. Or you may not actually put this on a building um, 
as the only cooling source. Um, let me explain that in a second. Um, so in California, we have tiered rates. <clears throat> so your first increment of electricity, you're paying a <clears throat> not, a very not a very high amount. Let's say you're paying $0.08 cents a kilowatt. Then you're paying $0.12. Cents, then suddenly it jumps to tier three. You're paying $0.24. Cents, and then at the end of the month, you're using more and more. You're, you're paying now $0.36 cents a kilowatt. So there's a huge difference. Um, in the tier four price and your tier one price. So as a building manager, you'd like to try to save money. And that's a <clears throat> big incentive for them actually to, to reduce their electricity bill. The biggest drivers of, of your peak load are your air conditioning and in the winter, your, your heating. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea, our idea is if you put one of these machines into a building sup as a supplemental chiller. So a building has a 500 ton load. You put a machine in there that's 50 tons. And basically, that's your first source of cooling. So you keep the existing chiller on the building, and you add this as a supplementary chiller. It also can be called a pony chiller. You can actually see huge reductions in your energy costs because that machine now is <clears throat> it's not powered by electricity. So your electricity bill is, is it's not going to, the amount of electricity you're using might only be 10% less, but you're going to save 30 or 40% on your utility bill because it's expensive electricity. Um, <clears throat> a lot of buildings, this is a, this is a computer science building. I would not be surprised if there are rooms in this building that have, they may be, they may be server farms like this where there's so much heat that that room needs. And even though this building was presumably designed from the ground up for this purpose, that that room needs more cooling than the main system the building is actually providing, right? So um, that's a problem because what's happening is your main chiller for the whole building is being cranked up just for that one room. So it's incredibly inefficient. And this is very, very common. In fact, um, I was talking to an office manager for a big commercial developer. A lot of offices now are, are, when they have vacant space, they're turning them into these sort of server rooms because you can now this sort of do cloud computing and, and those kind of settings. And they have this, this problem in office buildings. So our thought, again, is to provide cooling. You could do it in rack, or you could provide spot cooling to the room. Um, use a small chiller. It doesn't have to be for the whole building, but you use a chiller that just works for that specific room. Um, and you're going to have a significant savings on your utility bill, because your, your main chiller is not going, going um, crazy. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about, so <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about the market. So when you're designing technology, have you guys come across um, this idea from Steve Blank? Uh, are you familiar who's, with who Steve Blank is? Um, okay. So this is one, one of the key things that's, that we learn in the Clean Tech Open. Steve Blank's a professor at Stanford. Um, uh, he does this very interesting history of Silicon Valley, which is I recommend you, you guys check out. It's online. You can find it on YouTube. But what he's known, one of the things he's known for is for getting out entrepreneurs, quote unquote, out of the building. So when you're designing something, making sure that what, what people, what, what um, engineers and entrepreneurs like to do is they've got an idea, they've talked to a couple people and it seems pretty cool, and they've talked to their friends or their co-founders and it seems pretty cool and everybody's on the same page. And what they like to do at that point is basically go and take the time to build the machine or to build the, the software application. And so they, they put a lot of time and energy into that. And what, they typically, what typically happens is they come out the other end and it turns out they really haven't talked to the people that, that they're trying, their potential customers. So he's got a, a very, very, um, it's, it's a very important, um, basically, framework for continually getting out of the building and talking to your customers at every step, even before you build the thing, to figure out if what you're building anybody's actually interested in. Um, and so from that point of view, um, particularly because, and, and, he, and you know, so when, we, when you go through the Clean Tech Open, we actually spend a, a bunch of time, you try to talk to, they, they encourage you to try to talk to almost 100 customers. And we're talking about, you know, like managers of buildings, you know, people who manage a whole block of office portfolios. I talk to somebody, you know, who manages Whole Foods stores, you talk to the HVAC installers, talk to the people who, um, you know, residential customers from all sorts of different um, markets. So one of the things that I learned in that process is that people who buy HVAC equipment are pretty risk averse. This is, they don't want the air conditioning system on this building to break down. They, they're not going to take a risk on a brand new technology. So 
that's one of the reasons for, for us as a strategy that we didn't want to come in and say, replace your whole building chiller. We were more than happy to say, try out our system as a supplementary system, as an add-on, because there really isn't risk in that case. You haven't, you're, we're not asking you to take your own system offline. Um, but we identified, you know, they look at it as there's technical risk because they don't know if the, the new technology is going to work. And you guys are going to uh, face that with what you design. There's also financial risk because they don't know if, if it actually performs as well as you say and it's going to save you money. Um, and, and there's a, a adoption risk where they have tenants typically in that building and those, those tenants don't want to hear that they've just put on a new chiller and so it's for some reason the building um, is really hot and the, t the tenant should be okay with the fact that we're trying a new green technology. Um, they, they're responsible for the tenants to keeping the system online all the time. Um, so that's sort of what we've, that's kind of our approach. So there's more than just sort of the core technology here. There's figuring out how you're going to get it into market. And especially how are you going to get it to market initially? How are you actually going to generate sales um, from the technology that you develop? So, um, you know, we, so this was the approach to sort of doing peak shaving and spot cooling as a way to mitigate this risk. Okay. So, I'm going to leave it there. Um, hopefully, I touched on a couple different things, and I think you know if there's, I definitely welcome questions and happy to field any any questions you guys have. Great, thank you. I'm really glad that you touched on the design process because we we remember Kimberly's uh, talk about design thinking earlier in the quarter. That this was a nice. Tie in, you know, if you if you're not designing something the customer actually wants, you know, what good is it? So that that was really good. I like I like the business model a lot, folks. That this is this is revolutionary. Any thoughts? I know it's late in the quarter and late in the day. Yeah. So so. Our chiller, so I showed you the efficiency graph, so, so there's, there's a couple inputs in terms of the efficiency. Yeah. So, Is it like, like the other ones that, are, like if you have a higher temperature, you're going to get more efficient devices? Just like That's right. So, um, a traditional, so this is a single effect chiller. Single effect is basically, the cycle occurs once. A double effect chiller uses the waste heat and reruns it through the chiller. Um, <laughs> nice. So we've, at this point, we've built a single effect machine. We can actually build a, a double effect machine off of this platform. But um, we're, we're calculating anything up, up to potentially a COP of 1.6. And right now, the single effect chillers um, achieve a COP of uh, under 0.9. Um, I think it's even less than that. Yeah, so it's about it, it's about 75% more efficient. And the key thing actually is, so for solar cooling, um, a little bit of the real world of it, um, I described some different kinds of solar thermal collectors. The ones that are most affordable and reliable are the flat plate and evacuated tube collectors, and those are the ones that, um, you know, there's companies in Europe that make them and, and they're easy to obtain, but also there's Chinese manufacturers that make them, and there's whole cities in China that have get their domestic hot water from solar thermal. Um, same thing with Israel. I think in Israel it may be mandated to, to in residential applications to get um, domestic hot water from solar thermal. Uh, so if, if we can have a chiller that runs at lower um, input temperatures, which, which qualifies for those kinds of collectors, that's sort of the, the magic um, bullet. Um, a lot of folks in the solar thermal industry have been trying to find a chiller that works well at low input temperatures. Because those other kinds of collectors, um, there are some companies out there that make them, but there, it's been very tough for those companies to get market traction because they're really only used for a couple applications like this. Solar cooling and then maybe process heating. They've had a really tough time. A lot of those companies, startups, um, have failed. Um, it's been very difficult for them to get traction. whereas um, 
the companies that make flat plate and evacuated tubes, they're, they're run of the mill, they're, they're easily available off the shelf. So getting a, making a chiller that has a driving temperature, so the input temperature into the chiller is low enough, so let's say 170, 60, 160 degrees Fahrenheit um, is kind of the key thing, and, and then having the chiller perform efficiently. Does that make sense? Uh, speaking of the economics, do you guys have done any studies on the payback time? So you said that you can like, kind of cut off part of your expenses by right. that. Do you have any estimates of how Yeah, long yeah, we have. I didn't bring those numbers. Um, yeah. Maybe I didn't bring the financials, but the um, it depends on the kind of system. So if it's a solar cooling system, the payback is a little bit longer, um, but you get a bigger payback in the lifetime mm -hmm. of the system, right? Um, so I think with a solar system, and, and there's a host of variables. So one of the big variables is how much solar radiation do you get at your location? So if it's Phoenix, Arizona um, versus Europe, so the irony is that Europe has generally the solar radiation of Alaska, right? So <laughs> this is the irony that Europe is so f much further ahead in solar adoption than the US because we have much more solar radiation. Um, but uh, you know, in Phoenix, Arizona, you could look at a potentially a four to five year payback on a solar cooling system. You, and you could look at a, the scenario that I gave you, that's from, from my point of view, the best payback, this idea of sort of a supplemental chiller. Because um, where electricity rates are high, um, and if you can shave off, um, you know, that peak rate, you could be looking at, you know, one year or two year um, paybacks, even potentially on a solar cooling system, because it's a small system, and it's you know the the, the electricity you're paying that you're now saving at that rate is is so high. Um, now, if the system, if we set up a system that was running on waste heat, so if you had a building that was generating a lot of waste heat, payback is much sooner because you don't have to put on the solar panels and the racking and piping from the from the solar panels. So, if it was only powered by waste heat. Um, and, and then also with gas, the payback could, could also potentially be much sooner because gas is about a third the price per unit of energy of electricity. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. so are you targeting data centers? That would be pretty obvious, wouldn't it? Well, the waste heat from data centers is not high enough. Ah. It's, a pretty, it's a very low grade waste heat. I mean, it's the most elegant example, right? I think it's the one I used with people initially, right? This idea that the, the, the biggest problem in a data center is to get rid of its heat. So if you could actually take that heat and turn it into cooling, you'd have a virtuous cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of the basic example with solar cooling. I think that's, that's as a framework, that, that's the easiest way to think about it. Yeah. Um, the challenge is that computers don't generate 150 or 160 degree heat because they'd melt the servers. Um, so <laughs> there is a slightly counterintuitive way to go about this that I think we need to model out. You could actually potentially um, get a heat pump to, in, to heat, to take that heat and increase it um, to the point where then you could use it for cooling. Right, so you basically be adding heat to the system. It's a little counterintuitive, but if you had enough heat, then then you could actually power the the cooling. So it, it, that could be a possibility. Yeah. I think I read there is a company in Germany. It's a startup, and they uh, they put their servers in different offices to heat up the offices. Uh -huh. So you can have your own server just to have, you know. If they if they trust if they have a yeah if they trust people in that office not to oh I mean yeah it's like you see vibes in this market I mean I think that's that's smart you know I read that um, something like a third of the energy um, that we consume uh, f let's say just for heating and for process heating so process heating and heating is about forty percent of the energy that's consumed and it's something like a third of it is basically dumped as waste heat. So, you know, there is a challenge in sort of how to capture that and if it's low, like super low grade waste heat like from a computer, which we have a lot, um, or usable for our system, which would be like 150 degrees on up, or, you know, in industrial processes where it's quite a bit higher. Yeah. Are you doing any R&D to try to reduce the capital cost of the system? Um, so, so that's the key. Um, the, the system's designed from, from the beginning to try to basically um, reduce its capital cost compared to a vapor compression chiller. Not a, so the system's going to be less expensive than a traditional absorption chiller. Um, traditionally, absorption chillers actually cost on a you know, per installed ton basis, they cost somewhere between 
they're about three times more expensive than a vapor compression chiller, which is a big difference. And um, it's, it is one of the reasons why their the adoption is not nearly as high. Um, it, uh, so what we're trying to do is compete with vapor compression chillers, with electric chillers, with the ones that are ubiquitous, because that's, that's really what we need to do. Um, and so we're, everything we're doing now is focusing on optimizing the um, manufacturing to do it. So that's the idea is get rid of all the mechanical components, <clears throat> you know, simple sheets that, you know, you're either etching or, or laser cutting and stamping, um, you know, simple assembly of the components. Um, yeah, those are the critical things. <clears throat> Again, from an engineering perspective, from, from the standpoint of how to design it initially, you know, how, how, where to think about the problem um, in terms of what your cost, customer needs. So if an absorption chiller is three times more than a vapor compression chiller, you know, the cost of energy has to be so much higher uh, for them to, uh, for, a, for a customer to, to make the choice. And the problem is also that they're not as efficient. Um, so that, that's where we're, we're sort of making a leap both in terms of cost and in terms of efficiency. Yeah. So what is, what's the current scale of, of manufacturing and do you think that kind of like you saw with, with solar as the scale of manufacturing went up, the cost came down yeah. quite dramatically. Is that something you guys are yeah. coming I mean, on? Or <coughs> it's going to be the, the current scale for manufacturing. The, the current scale is pre-production, pre pre right? right? What we're doing right now, we're sending, um, in the next um, month or so, we're going to send a unit to, again, one of the key things in industries like HVAC is you need independent verification of the performance of the technology. So we're sending a machine to Oak Ridge National Labs and they're going to test it. They have PhDs in absorption cooling um, that they'll test it. Um, and that's an important sort of step in the process. Um, and by the way, labs like that actually work, can work with you to help optimize the machines for manufacturing as well. So they can be a great resource in, in other ways too. Um, <clears throat> they have you know, the, some of the largest supercomputers in the world. Um, but at, at scale, it will, the cost will definitely come down. I mean, it's basically like the, the plasma TV metaphor. You know, they were $10,000 a few years ago, and now they're $500. So, you know, this is even, that, that was even true for, you know, s such a large, sort of, you know, widely entered industry from so many different players. Yeah. Um, but see, the, in terms of how to get from startup mode to product maturity, that's, that's the key, right? And that's where this, for us, this strategy of doing supplemental cooling where we can save the most money, even if the machine is three times more right now than what it would be when we mass manufacture it and we still offer a savings to, to customers and people who are gonna be the early adopters. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's key. In fact, there was a um, venture capitalist from Kosla who I was speaking with and he, from his point of view, he pointed out that most clean tech technologies that have actually been able to cross the valley of death, you know this idea from, uh, okay. So that they have basically been able to find some market where despite the fact that they're, soup, they're, they're, they're much higher cost than they will be at scale, that they're still going to be competitive. So they found some way, whether it was incentives for solar panels in Germany and Spain, or you know, s some way Tesla with batteries um, in order to, to bridge that valley. So there has to be some way, means of attacking the market where you can still be cost competitive and compelling to, to customers who want to save money, not just be green. So I'm wondering, can you, maybe you're considering it, do the sort of solar city model? I know that helped us get solar on our roof was this, these blended lease yeah. buy options. We are considering it. We're okay, considering. Good. We're we're considering this also the idea of cooling as a service. So the idea that you would not sell people the machine, you would sell them cooling. Yes. Um, so it's a little bit trickier than, than solar because um, solar is a photovoltaic. You, you um, offer them electricity, so it has multiple uses, cooling, cooling. So our machine actually, I failed to mention this. So an absorption chiller is a heat pump. So you can run it in reverse and it provides heating. So our machine will actually be roughly twice as efficient as other combustion heaters. So Absorption chillers aren't usually used as heaters because they're not that efficient, but we're actually looking at, again, so the, you have the machine, you can use it all year round, those kinds of rooftop applications. So basically in, in heating season, you, you reverse it and, and you can provide heating at, at um, a cost savings as well. Mm. Yeah. So how much does the machine cost? Well, I don't want um, <laughs> I don't, I don't to um, talk specific numbers at this stage because we're still pre-production. I mean, we're tar what we're targeting is a cost a capital cost per, per ton just for the chiller. 
um, that'll be competitive with vapor compression chillers. Yeah, that's that's our goal, um, and I and I think we can do it um, because of the again the the simplicity and elegance of the design. What's your ratio right now? How much you know, I think that's a tough, tough question still for us at this stage because we're pre-production. In terms of the materials and you know all of the you know the bill of materials as we've, as we've added it up, I think we're. Um, I, I think if we simply scaled it up in terms, so you know, working with a, ma a manufacturing partner that can do sort of large-scale manufacturing of it, I think we're probably not that far off. There's still some optimizing we can do with the materials. Um, you know, some of these things depend on quote-unquote space-age materials, right? Like the, the plastics have to withstand certain temperatures so that you're using plastic in those sheets versus steel. Yeah, so th those are some of the considerations. Yeah. That's really exciting. Thank you so much. Sure. Oh, oh sorry. If you wanted to build like a, a business like Solar City, do you get subsidies as well from California or something like that? Or you do. So, so there's, all, there's subsidies, subsidies at different levels. There's a database that'll make, make your head spin a little bit called DSIRE, um, Desire, which tracks, it's, somebody maintains it out of North Carolina, they track incentives around the country. So there's like, there's incentives at a federal level, there's incentives at a state level, there's utility incentives, there's some municipalities have incentives, and when any given customer comes to you, you sort of try to figure out, so that, that's why they have this database, which is helpful. Um, yeah, so, so there, there are incentives um, in, in different countries. The trick, again, with a business like this um, is you don't want to build it relying on the incentives. You have to be cost competitive without them because like Spain and Germany found out, you know, those incentives can change, change overnight and you don't want to um, basically uh, lose your whole sort of fundamental business model because the incentive's not there. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and there's some incentives right now in California for solar thermal. It's, um, the, the California Solar Initiative, called CSI, um, it has um, they put aside a, a certain amount of money for different things. The, the photovoltaic money, I think, has already been used up, um, and the solar thermal has not been as aggressively used up. The solar thermal industry is having just whether or not this is of interest to you guys, but it, it's having challenges because PV is sort of sexy. PV is the thing that everybody seems to be putting in. Um, uh, th there are a number of other incentive programs that are out there that'll align for PV, and um, the price of gas came down. And so the biggest the biggest issue for for solar thermal panels is, is a low price of gas because that's what they're competing against. That's where you're, the, the end users is trying to make a decision about how much money they can save. So we're in the position where we can use the gas. So low cost gas is not necessarily a bad thing for, for a chiller, um, but it's really tough for the solar thermal industry. So, you know, these are the, this is sort of like the realities that you're dealing with when, when you're thinking about um, how to design an a, um, a environmental a, 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 um, clean tech technology. Okay, thank you so oh. much.